Hello, everyone. Let's unwind after a hard week with these stories that will both astound and delight you. Welcome to this week's roundup. This is for you if you missed some of our videos or simply wish to rewatch them. Like and subscribe to receive more stories like this. Remember to provide the timestamp of your recommended content in the comment area. What's something that you'll never share with your parents? Viewers edition. Story one. Ever since I became an adult, got married, and had kids, I delight in telling my dad the crappy things I did as a teen that he had no idea about. He was a dope addict, sober 27 years, yet strict with me, his only child, and his daughter to an extent of a lot of lectures on not having intercourse, yet he let me go on the pill and eventually move in with my boyfriend, now husband. So explaining to him how at 12 my cousin and I could sneak out of grandma's house at 3 a.m. to go down to the local local Ar Arco station and bribe adults into buying us beer? Funny as hell! Especially because I was relatively the quiet good girl and my sister, same mom, different dads, was in juvenile hall before she turned 14. I was the good kid he didn't worry about. That was ditching school behind his back and getting my tweaker cousins to call my school and tell them I was sick. Why ditch? I was really getting behind on my soap operas. If my folks had figured out how to program the VCR so I didn't miss The Young and the Restless, I wouldn't have missed a lot. I would have missed a lot less school. As a parent, all I can think is how they could have easily held that recording over my head daily to get my homework and chores done. But the worst one yet, we lived in an apartment complex and as a resident knew how to break in and out. It was as easy as knowing what window on the units you could slightly push and slide back the lock to get in. Well, my friends stayed over and we didn't want to go to school. This was junior high and they were experimenting with year round. Meaning there were four different tracks that came and went. Because it was poorly executed, there were weeks where, say, yellow track and blue track overlapped for a couple days and had the same classroom, which was insanity. So it was one of those types of days where we knew no real school would happen. They also did this whole, I was on a blue track, we were off for a month, came back and did a month of review, then as soon as we started to learn things again, it was time to share the classroom and then get ready for our next month off. So yeah, it was poorly executed and no one learned anything during that time. Lots of ditching happening. Anyhow, my friend and I were ditching, but we couldn't stay at my apartment because my mom was there. We had to go somewhere till she left. I can honestly say this was the day Magic Johnson announced he had HIV, because later in the day we went to my cousin's and that was on the TV. So we broke into an empty apartment that had already been cleaned up and was ready to be shown to a prospective renter. We slept on the floor for a bit, then we were bored to death. We also had our school bags and for some reason a Playgirl mag. For anyone who doesn't know, Playgirl is like Playboy, only instead of naked women, it's naked men. We also had tape because of school stuff. So we opened up cabinets and taped up pages from said Playgirl mag so that when one opened a cabinet, boom, naked dude, right in the face. We only did this on cabinets that adults could reach, however. I do love the morals of, we're gonna put up pictures of naked dudes, but we're gonna make sure that only adults are seeing that, and I can appreciate that. Um, I could also just appreciate all the other wild stuff you were doing, but your parent considering you the good kid, and so therefore, you could just kind of get away with stuff. I was the good kid, and so I could get away with stuff. I, I usually didn't, because I was a good kid, <laughs> mostly. Not completely. Story 2. I kinda knew I wasn't biologically related to my dad when I was around 7. Pretty smart kid. They officially told me when I was 12. I had to nod along to make it seem like I wasn't completely uninterested in something I already half confirmed. Story 3. I ordered a book online and because I was a teen with no bank account, I ordered it with an option to pay the postman at the arrival. The book arrived when I wasn't home, but my grandma was. She paid and told me not to give her back the money, but to treat it as a gift for that church ceremony I had she didn't give me anything for. What grandma didn't know was the book was a collection of gay love stories. I've been heavily into yaoi since I turned 16, and nobody in my Catholic family knew, otherwise half of them would have a heart attack. I never told grandma what was in the package. Dad took the book once and looked at the cover, and I internally freaked out, but luckily he didn't turn it to read the description, and the front didn't betray the content. 
Dad still doesn't know, but my mom does. Story 4. I've got something similar to the last story. About halfway through my CS degree in college, I wanted to get into PC gaming. I was big into gaming and always loathed that my office desktop wasn't powerful enough for much. In the late stages of my degree work, I did need something more powerful for my schoolwork, so I approached my dad and said I wanted to get a new computer but couldn't afford one myself. He asked what sort of specs I was looking for and why. I explained that I needed something more powerful to handle the likes of Android Studio and VS. I gave him the specs for a decently high-end gaming computer. He is very tech-savvy and came back to me like an hour later and said something along the lines of, You're trying to get a gaming PC, aren't you? To which I said, Well, I need a better computer for my schoolwork, but I also wanted something better for gaming, so why not get one that can do both? He sighed and agreed to pay $500, and I was to cover the rest. I got an $1,100 mid to high end gaming computer and was happy. Honestly, needing a powerful computer is such a wonderful gift because it can also very easily become a gaming computer. Sure, you need it for 3D modeling or for programming or this or that, or in my case, I needed a powerful one for video editing and stuff like that. And it's like, well, if my computer needs to be powerful and have good graphics for video editing, might as well be good for gaming too. Story 5. In 6th grade, my mom wouldn't let me take my phone to school, but I did it anyway. From October to June. I couldn't really do anything because I didn't have a number or cellular service at the time. Honestly, it was just to be rebellious. Anyways, we were at one of the many family gatherings we have around the holidays, and my mom was talking about how I wasn't allowed to take my phone to school. That was probably the funniest and most ironic moment I can remember. Story 6. Back in the 90s, my dad actually got arrested at least once, either driving away from the police while drunk or DUI, and he never told his parents about that incident. Even when his dad passed, he never told them a single detail. Story 7. This was before I was a teenager, I was 8, but I used to have a phobia of toilets because I believed monsters used to snatch children from the toilet itself. So, I used the backyard as my toilet. My parents noticed an accumulation of poo randomly appearing all over the yard. My dad at the time believed it was the neighbor's dog getting into our yard and pooping in there. When he would get rid of the poo, he'd fling it over the fence into their yard. This caused arguments to happen between my parents and the neighbors. The thing was, their dog did have a history of escaping into our yard and doing its business there, so for a long time, that dog took the blame until my phobia subsided. I still will never tell my parents this. Okay, I have to ask, was your phobia of toilets because of some old VHS tape? Back when horror movies just had weird little puppet monsters all the time, and I think it might have been, like, Critters or Critters Adjacent. But back in, like, late 80s, early 90s, there was some horror movie with a little puppety creature that was, like, sitting on or coming out of a toilet, and that freaked me out as a kid, too. <laughs> And I would try and get my siblings to wait around the bathroom when I had to use it when I was, like, six. <laughs> That's true. Story 8. One of my English tests. I'm a writer. I love writing stories, and I'm slowly getting better. However, my favorite thing to write is kind of angsty stuff. I don't know, it's just the easiest thing for me to write. So, in one of our English tests, we were given a story about two bullies and had to rewrite a part from another perspective. I chose to write from the perspective of the kid who was getting bullied and wrote about her depression, fear, difficulties at home, and finally, her self-termination pretty detailed. I don't want to show that to my dad. Might not be as spectacular as all the drug or sneaking out stories, but I don't do drugs and never really tried sneaking out either. Worst I did was take some of my dad's ALC and obviously drink it, or staying at school during random crap with my friends instead of going home, but who hasn't? Story 9. Well, my dad doesn't know I somehow managed to walk in on him in the bath once without him knowing, saw everything, quietly and slowly walk back out. If you can't fake parent signatures, just trace them like I used to. Works a treat. The correct response when your dad says bloody teenagers when he sees the smiley face you spray painted in the road directly outside your own house is, yeah, kids these days don't have anything better to do. He still doesn't know. Story 10. 
I brought my dad a permission slip at the beginning of middle school, and he said, you should just sign it yourself so you don't need to bother with learning my signature. I rejected his offer because I'm a good boy. So yeah, pro tip, just sign everything yourself from the beginning. Okay, that's a pretty good gamble, and it's pretty smart, unless your dad eventually goes to, like, a parent-teacher conference, and the teacher's just like, no, this is a slip that you sign, and the dad's like, that's not my signature, and suddenly unravels your whole web, and then you're in a whole bunch of trouble. Or maybe you get, you know, maybe your dad's a spy and appreciates it. I don't know, but I doubt the story ends that well. Story 11. Oh, the things we did and got away with. I'm 67. No doubt my kids did the same. They are good, solid adults today, and for that, I'm extremely grateful. We all made it to adulthood unscathed. What seems impressive to others, but is actually easy? Story 1. Cabling. I learned how to terminate Cat 5 and 6, phone lines, fiber, low volt panels, and coaxial cables when I was 14 and still fall back on it to make good money here and there. People look at me like I'm a strange wizard, waving thousands of feet of cable and bundles hanging from the ceiling. The termination is the easy part. I've spent years trying to teach guys how to run said cables so they look nice and don't get caught under ceiling grids. People get so intimidated by wires, but it's so simple. I've been hired by cable military installations and big tech companies in Silicon Valley. One company paid me a ridiculous amount of money to build a network rack for Apple. And you know what took the most time? Cutting Velcro and making all them pastel patch cords look nice. Tech career? I obtained two creative writing degrees because words couldn't pass on the giant reduction in salary. Honestly, folks, it's kind of good advice where if you don't know what to do with your life, just find something that you think is just kind of easy to do that other people don't seem to want to do. And bada boom, you have a business. It's as easy as that. Sometimes. Story two. Playing guitar. It is relatively affordable and very simple and fun once you get a feel for it. You also don't need lessons nowadays thanks to the internet. I play four instruments, bass, guitar, trombone, trumpet, and guitar definitely has the most straightforward learning process. Just play it and you will get better. Please note that styles of music vary in difficulty. Styles like metal or jazz often focus on showing off instrumental skill, whereas other styles like rock or country focus on the overall feeling of the music and will usually be simpler. Also be aware that playing Latin style music may cause female clothing to mysteriously disappear. Just thought I'd let you know. Oh, it's not just female clothing. Because let me tell you, if someone starts playing some Rodrigo y Gabriela, sorry for my pronunciation there, but uh, my pants have been known to just fully disintegrate upon hearing some of those tunes. So uh, just take note, everyone. Story 3. Being able to read hiragana and katakana. My family and friends are always super impressed whenever I read something Japanese, but really you can learn one of them in under a month, or even a matter of days if you really put your mind to it. I went on a group trip to Japan through my school when I was 17, and there was one guy who mastered them both in about three weeks for the sake of the trip. You just need some knowledge of Japanese pronunciation slash accents and a decent memory. Apparently, Korean writing is similarly easy to learn, but I haven't tried it myself yet. Knowing kanji when Japanese is your second language, on the other hand, is actually impressive. It takes most people years to learn the amount that a native speaker knows. Story 4. I can tell you, because of my work, tossing pizza really isn't as amazing as customers make it seem. After watching my manager for a few months, I tried it and threw one just fine. We use one-pound dough balls and average an 18-inch pizza, but after a month or two, I was able to get one to 30-plus inches in diameter. Not usable, way too thin, but it didn't have any holes. Customers watch me as if I'm casting magic spells, eyes all wide, like, wow! It's a nice feeling, but you can honestly learn to do it in an hour or so. Now, throwing them to volume, that is, faster than orders come in, and doing tricks does indeed take a lot of practice, and I'm still learning every day due to minute inconsistencies in dough, sauce, and oven conditions. This is absolutely true, because if you have made your pizza dough correctly, it's pretty elastic. The glutens that form in everything, you know, especially a lot of pizza doughs that you're tossing have, like, sat and developed gluten structure for, like, days in the fridge. Like, a good pizza dough sometimes is, like, in the fridge for three, four days, maybe a week. 
And so it's really elastic. Like, yeah, you can just toss that stuff around. It's really not that hard. Story five, having basic organizational skills at work. People are astounded by color-coded items, putting things into tables, and just making everything easy to read. It takes 10 minutes to just sort and put things in their place. A low upkeep and labor task that makes you look miles ahead of your peers. Story six, fixing basic stuff. Maybe I'm just unusually stubborn and patient, but I've been fixing appliances, cars, etc. since I was 14. It doesn't even require that you have knowledge of what you're fixing. All it takes is curiosity and persistence and Google. I get kind of annoyed when people take the attitude that things are simply no good once they've broken in a minor way. Story seven, writing with both hands. I had my right hand broken and I taught myself to write with my left hand. For the first few hours, it was uncomfortable, but I got the hang of it quite quickly, maybe three to four hours, and I was unable to use my right hand for three weeks. I got so used to writing with the left hand that even 10 years later, I can write just as well with both. Story 8. Baking. I get tons of compliments anytime I make something. I usually just Google easy one I find. Story 9. Solving a Rubik's Cube. Buy a Rubik's Cube, get a notepad and pen, watch Dan Brown's video on solving, take notes. Less than three to four hours later, you should be done. Story 10. V lookups and pivot tables and Microsoft Excel. It's astounding to me that those two abilities are impressive to anyone, but it is also possible that I work with people who really and truly have no business being employed using computers, so I don't know. To be fair, it is not that I find that stuff in Excel particularly difficult. It's that it's really, really boring, and I don't want to do it. So, yeah. Story 11. Play the recorder. Once I learned how to play Darude Sandstorm and my heart will go on, I was drowning in the poontang. Story 12. I built my own computer. Everyone in my family thinks I'm some sort of genius, and they tell effing everyone that I built it. They view it as some sort of rocket science. It felt like building with Lego. All right, but there are sometimes, like, things that you need to look up, like, you know, oh, will this processor work with this motherboard, and what type of RAM is best for what I want the system to do, and... There are certain quirks, still not that hard. You just have to look the stuff online and kind of reference it, and people have done the work for you, but it's a little more complicated than Lego. Like, actually just sitting and putting the stuff together in the end, not bad. But knowing what stuff you can put together, a little bit harder. Story 13. In high school, my friend and I learned the Russian alphabet. You could memorize it in a day, and we would write English words but use Russian letters. We would pass notes around and write in Russian, and people would find them and be like, the F is this? Story 14. People in my office are impressed with my ability to solve IT-related issues. I just know how to Google things properly. Story 15. Finding whatever you want to watch for free online. Story 16. Play the piano. Just gotta do it a bunch of times. And by that, I mean with weekly lessons for an hour a day for 20 years. Story 17. I know juggling isn't that impressive, but it's not hard to learn at all. Oh, God. Weirder. Huh. Guess they're right. Ah! <laughs> oh, one more try and then you'll just have to use the best one. Whatever. <laughs> huh. Guess they're right. <laughs> and then I drop one. <laughs> Shit. Huh. <laughs> they were. <laughs> huh. Guess they're right. Story 18. Programming, apparently. People seem to think I write programs in binary for some reason. Story 19. Learning to cook. Have a few great recipes up your sleeve and practice till perfect. Everyone will be impressed. Story 20. Opening a beer bottle using a lighter. 
Story 21, Basic Computer Skills, The Eternal Struggle of the Family Tech Guy. Story 22, To Be a Good Listener, Not Many People Are Good at It. What's the rudest question you've ever received? Content warning! Bigotry and body shaming is in this video, and it's from a bunch of sucky people, and we're going to make fun of them, but also just have it in here so folks know stuff that they shouldn't say, in case you're wondering. Story 1. I'm white and my ex-wife is black. Our kids are mixed, but differ a lot in shades of darkness. My oldest son is almost as dark as her, while my youngest daughter could pass for white. We were in the grocery store once, and we only had our daughter with us while my son was at preschool. My wife was at one end of the aisle with my daughter in the cart, and I was at the other end grabbing something. A very old lady, maybe in her 70s, came into the aisle on the same side as my wife and daughter, and she had a weird look of concern. I walked back over and the old lady saw that we were together and started smiling in relief. As we walked away, she touched my arm and said, Are you happy with her? I didn't understand, so I asked her what she meant. She said, Oh, I just mean, is she a good nanny? Would you recommend her services? My daughter needs one. She's using a Latina woman now, but I told her the problem with those people is if she steals something, the police won't be able to find her. She probably has no records. Anyway, I think it's absolutely wonderful that you let her come shopping with your child. People gave me such insults for letting our nanny do that 50 years ago, but you know, times were different. To this day, I still crack up and I remember the look on my ex-wife's face. I never knew eyes could get so wide. The funniest part about it was you couldn't even be mad because in that lady's mind, she was being very progressive. Oh, old people who are unintentionally being racist. Like, I don't know. I don't know if you can say that, you know, she had all the best intentions because there's some real crap in there, but... I don't know. Sometimes you at least have to give the really old folks some credit for trying, I guess. Story 2. Did your dad want a boy? I'm a lady. My first name is a very traditional masculine name. I was not named after my father, but rather two other ladies in my family. One named herself, paternal great-great-aunt, whose given name was Oda. She didn't care for it. And the other was named after her father when he died of Spanish influenza right before she was born. Great-grandmother. I go by my middle name, which is infinitely more feminine, if still unisex. My name is a source of pride for my family. It is unique and was carried by two beautiful women before my parents thought that I was special enough to have it, too. To get to the point, I get asked that question every time a stranger finds out my first name, no matter if I'm picking up a prescription, getting my driver's license renewed, or getting fingerprinted for work. I hear it at least twice a month. It's none of your business whether my dad wanted a son or was happy with the daughter he got, but thanks for reminding me that I will never live up to his standards because I don't have a dong. Thanks for reminding me that our family name will die because I'm a girl. Yes, he bloody wanted a boy, you dong, but that's not why my name is masculine. Like, yeah, don't ask people about their names like that. Like, at least that's just such a weird way to go about asking it. Like... Oh, I don't usually hear that name uh, with uh, women and everything, you know. Where did that come from? That's a nice way of asking. But just being like, you know, Oh, did one of your parents not like you for the way you are? Tell me that. Like, <laughs> a little bit of tact. Just, just a smidgen of tact makes all the difference. Story 3. I was crashing with my brother and his wife for a mini vacation slash catch-up visit since he had moved away. While I was there, he was still on duty, military, during the day, so I would help his wife around the house with stuff as she was in the last one to two months of pregnancy with my nephew at the time. At one point she needed groceries, so I rode with her to help with any heavy lifting, etc. We went through as normal and got everything she needed, and while we were on the beer slash liquor aisle, I asked if I could hand her the cash for my beer and just tack it onto their total since she was paying with a card to save time. She obliged, I handed her the cash, and then put a 30-pack of Bud in the car. We went to go check out, I'm unloading everything onto the conveyor belt, and she's waiting to pay. I have no idea what possessed this freaking clerk. This late 20s to early 30s woman decided to go all high and mighty and blurt it out while scanning the beer. You know, it's not wise to drink when you're pregnant. Jesus would be awfully disappointed. 
I was about to pipe up that it was mine, but before I could even utter a single word, my sister-in-law said, very flatly, it's not for me, it's for my partner, and she isn't pregnant. The look on the cashier's face was priceless. Your sister-in-law is awesome. Story 4. So does she not put out, or just one of those women's lib types? I was calling about a job and had to go through a manager before I got to the main hiring person. The manager was a nice guy. We talked for a bit and he told me he could pass me on. Hiring person picks up and we start talking. Sounds a little old school douchey, but whatever. Then he gets to his personal life. Him. Just so you know, this is a very family-oriented place. All of us have families and we consider it a very important thing. Me. That's good to hear. I'm actually engaged. We've been together about four years. Him. Oh, that's great. Got any kids? Maybe on the way? Me. Well, no, not yet. I was 21 at the time. Him. Oh, is she not putting out or just one of those women's lib types? I knew then what a blue screen of death felt like because I literally could not process what he'd said for at least a minute. He asked if I was still there and I lost my mind. I'd been job hunting for months, been told all sorts of horrible things, been ignored, treated like crap, and I just had enough of it at that point. I unloaded on him and called the boss. He was also very nice. I told him that I had an issue with one of his managers. Without saying anything else, I heard on the other end, God damn it, Jeff. Jeff was, in fact, the hiring manager I talked to. God damn it, Jeff, indeed. Like, <laughs> the fact that you didn't have to say anything beyond, like, you know, yeah, I said I had an issue with one of the managers, and the boss is immediately like, Jeff? Like, Maybe Jeff is a bit of an issue that needs to be addressed. <laughs> Story 5. During the early 90s, I was sporting quite a plumage of long rocker hair, and during the winter and spring ski season, I also grew quite a thick beard. One day I was at a gas station and I noticed two young kids staring at me intently. Their mother was also getting gas, but she was around on the other side of her car. The little boy who must have been about three or four and the little girl was probably about seven or eight. They were just staring at me. I finally said, Hi, how are you guys doing? The little boy turned and whispered something to his sister. She turned to me and said, He wants to know if you're a boy or a girl. A bit flummoxed by this forthright assault on my obvious manliness, I stammered, Uh, I'm um, a boy. She said, by way of explanation, He's never seen a boy with long hair before. Well, some boys have long hair, I replied a bit defensively. I know, she said. I've seen lots of boys with long hair. Really? I replied. Where? Oh, places like the dump. And that little kid grew up to be Professor Oak. Story 6. I worked at a Chinese restaurant as my first job, and you would not believe how often I get questions like, are they terrible to work for? Do they treat you well? Do you get paid on time slash full amount? Jesus, it made me sick to my stomach. He was the best boss and manager I ever worked for, and those kinds of questions irked me to no end. As if he would be an awful boss based on his ethnicity. The biggest bastards I ever worked for were from right here. I even saw one butthole customer asking him if he was 12 years old. Do you live here? Pointing at the floor. He was asking my boss if he lived in his restaurant. My boss replies, no, I don't live here. I have a house in X, Jesus. Beyond treating me like gold, he used to tell creepy guys right where to go if they were bothering me. Something that no other boss at a restaurant did for me. I always got a free meal every shift, plus he had me sit with his family every evening to enjoy a home-cooked meal at the end of each shift as well. Ay, what a bunch of weird, gross othering. Like, why? Why, do you, why would people just assume that and ask that kind of stuff? It just... It blows my mind. I don't understand why people have these kind of thoughts and air them out like that. It just... Ugh. I didn't even know what to say. Story 7. Had bad acne and stupid questions like, Why don't you wash your face slash bathe every day? Story 8. Are you self-conscious about your teeth? I am freaking out now. Story 9. Stares intently at my face. How many times have you broken your nose? The answer is none. Story 10. Most common question asked by complete strangers, often without introduction, because of my wheelchair is, Can you have intercourse? Variations. How does your dong work? Can you get an erection? Are you a virgin? 
But another classic is, how do you pee? For all of these questions, I of course perform a live demonstration. My brother gets that all the time from kids, stuff like, why are your legs broken? He just replies, because I didn't eat my vegetables. Horrified children and smiling parents. More cute than rude. Story 11. I've been asked if the government gives me compensation for being legally a midget. I do not have dwarfism. I am just really short. Technically, you might qualify for what they're talking about. One of my aunts does, and same thing. Story 12. Are you sure that acne medicine is working? Story 13. How does it feel to be cheated on? By the friend of a girl I once dated. I didn't even know she was cheating. She might have been doing you a favor. What's the worst you have seen a prank or joke backfire? Story 1. I was smitten with this beauty in high school. She was going to call me from her friend's house one Friday evening so that we could make arrangements to hang out. She lived not too far from me in the mountains. I was home having dinner with my family when I got a call from her friend who wanted to chat for a little while before she arrived. During the conversation, she informs me that she's looking out the window and she just saw the girl I liked crash her car into a tree. She screams and hangs up the phone. No answer when I call back. Several stressful minutes later, she calls me back crying and shouts that her friend has died. I lost it. My family sat there watching tears stream down my cheeks listening to this horrible news when all of a sudden I heard giggling on the other end of the line. Sucker, she said. These two girls had plotted the whole thing and nobody was actually in any accident. I hung up. I was awash with a rousing mixture of relief and blind rage. My stepdad suggested that we pull a little prank of our own as he dug up a box of Halloween makeup. The girls called to apologize and my mother calmly informed them that I had stormed out of the house in tears. We worked quickly to shred some clothes and using fake skin we transformed my face and arms to appear as if I had been mauled by a large cat. I looked gruesome. The girls called again to see if I had returned. Mom chastised them for pulling such a heartless prank and asked them to keep an eye out for me as she thought I had been heading their direction. Darkness had swallowed the day when we parked at the end of her quiet dirt road. I was dripping with theatrical blood as I limped slowly towards the house. My stepdad and brother were following from the other side of the street behind some very tall weeds. I started crying for help. Not long before I arrived in her driveway, I heard them calling my name as they ran in my direction. I collapsed in the dirt and laid there, sobbing and mumbling something about a mountain lion. Both of the, girl, both of the girls burst into tears. They were completely fooled by my wounds. My crush stayed with me while her friend ran to the house to call 911, and just before she reached the door, I jumped up and said, Gotcha. They chased while I ran as fast as my feet could carry me before they finally gave up. My stepdad and brother sprinting alongside and laughing the whole way. These are two very mean pranks. Like, pranking someone to think that, like, a friend or romantic interest of theirs is dead? That's... that's pretty mean. Like... I, I, I just, I don't know about that. But then pranking back with the cougar attack and stuff, I mean, one could argue that they deserved it, you know. They did the bad thing first, but man, oh man. I mean, at least you, like, jumped up and said gotcha before anything went too far. So, uh, I don't know, but man, oh man, that's, that's too much for my old heart to take. Story two. A little bit of backstory is required before I begin. When I was in grade 11, my English teacher, Mr. Crawford, went on personal leave because he had lost his entire family in a car accident. The entire school was devastated. He was an amazing man, he was funny and made learning fun, and everyone really liked him. When he was on his personal leave, we had a different substitute teacher every week for three weeks until Mr. James came along. Mr. James was by far the strictest teacher I ever had. He sucked the fun out of learning, and if you disrupted the class, he had a zero-tolerance policy. He would just kick you out. It didn't matter if you got kicked out on a Monday or a Friday, he wouldn't let you back in class for seven school days, and it made you think twice about disrupting the class. About five months go by, and I arrive early to class, about ten minutes early. I had uh, spare the block before Mr. James isn't in the classroom, and no one else is either. 
so I decided to unscrew the screws in his chair to cause it to collapse when he sits in it. It was a brilliant idea, he wouldn't have known who it was, and it would give the class a chance to laugh at the most hated teacher in the school. I go to sit down, and I wait patiently, and my fellow students begin to show up, but still no sign of Mr. James. I take out my PSP and get distracted playing it. Little did I know that Mr. Crawford was back today. Mr. Crawford enter enters the classroom and everybody notices, but I'm too distracted playing my PSP game when my friend beside me says, Hey, make me a steak. Mr. Crawford's back. And before I can say otherwise, he sits down at his desk and his chair collapses beneath him. He ended up fracturing his wrist while falling. I have never felt so guilty in my life. The man had just lost his entire family in a car accident five months ago, and on his first day back to work, he fractured his wrist because of me. I am a fan of pranks if done right. I think that pranks can be fun. They can be... Uh, I, I shouldn't encourage revenge, but I mean, you sometimes... No, don't. But I will say, I personally draw the line at any kind of prank that could physically injure somebody. Because a chair breaking like that... It could have ended even worse. It could have seriously hurt, maybe even killed someone. It's unlikely, I know, but any prank that has, like, a, ch a chance for something like that, a not wholly unreasonable chance, is not a prank that I think is necessarily worth it. Story 3. I live in England, and here it's widely expected that you buy drinks at the pub in rounds. Anyway, there was this one social circle at my local pub that regularly went there, and one guy became pretty infamous for always, and I mean always, dodging his round. Going to the gents, men's room, leaving early, forgetting his wallet were all common ways he'd avoid it. This guy was middle-aged and fairly wealthy, so there was really no excuse for it. Anyway, this pub doesn't have a TV, but usually reads out the national lottery numbers on a Saturday night. His friends knew this guy played, and arranged a prank where his wife briefly took his wallet to find out his numbers and then arranged for the pub landlord to read them out as the winning ones. The point was to see whether even when he had just become a millionaire, he'd still be too cheap to buy everyone a drink. They were all really excited about this, and every regular at the pub knew it was going to happen, so there was an unusually big crowd that night. Eventually, the time for the lottery numbers comes round, they get read out, and we all watch the growing look of realization in his face. He opens his wallet, gets out his ticket, and stares at it for like a minute, without any emotional reaction whatsoever. The guy then turns to his wife completely stoically and says, I've been having an affair with your sister for the last four years. You can keep the car in the house. He hands her the keys and strolls out the pub. Supposedly, she never heard from him again. She had to get divorced with him in absentia. The last my friends heard was that he moved to Australia. Okay, I mean, what an absolutely awful way for that wife to have to find out. Like, that's, you know, A, embarrassing for her. It shouldn't be, but I know it would be surrounded by all those people and stuff. But also, what a good way to get a scumbag to reveal himself and get her out of that marriage because she deserves better. And I hope that that jackbutt is miserable, you know, in Australia or whatever, or has at least learned a lesson and is trying to better himself. Story 4. Put a bowl of wet, cold spaghetti propped up over my little brother's bedroom door so it would fall on him when he opened it. Hour or two later, I heard the crash, ran down the hall to find my big, dumb dog happily covered in surprise spaghetti. Story 5. Find dead pigeons, put it on a classmate's desk. Classmate opens the desk. Pigeon flies away. Story 6. Not really the worst, but funny. I was about five years old. I thought it would be funny to sneak up on my dad and try to scare him, so I waited outside his bedroom door. Five-year-olds have no stealth, so he knew what I was doing. I'm poised and ready to spring, and my adrenaline is going up. I'm totally ready to scare him. Suddenly, my dad jumps out and says, Boo! I crapped my pants and started screaming. We both lost that game. Story 7. Unfortunately, slash fortunately, this wasn't my prank. A bunch of us were at a house party where we were all younger. Most of us got pretty drunk and decided to sleep over. 
As we all end up passing out, Buddy decides to take a habanero pepper and rub the juice on our hands along the thumb and forefinger, so when we woke up and rubbed our eyes, we have a rough wake up. Somehow in the process, he gets a seed stuck in his eyelid. He was not a smart man. We all wake up to him screaming in pain, and in our drunken stupor, we all rub our eyes, causing even more screaming. I still feel bad for the neighbors. Story 8. We had a senior basketball game at our school against a rival school that was out in the boondock. We'd always make fun of them for being chicken farmer hicks, and they'd make fun of us for being uppity city folk. So, my buddy gets his hands on five chickens. He puts paper signs on them with the names and numbers of the guys from the other team. He brought the crates to the upper office in the gym that had access to the rafters. He waited until just before halftime and then released all five chickens from the rafters, thinking they'll fly all over and create havoc. What he doesn't know is that chickens don't fly very well. All five of them plummeted the 50 feet or so to the gym floor as the seconds ticked away in the first half. All five of the chickens either died or were horribly crippled afterwards. They just kind of flopped around on the ground while everyone looked bewildered as to what the F was going on. Oh, the horror. He got suspended for a week. What are some double standards that don't involve gender? Story 1. In my freshman ELA class, our teacher put my best friend and me next to each other. This was a teacher who was very monotone, like it was never interesting to go to her class. I was trying to be a good student, but one day she yelled at me for a dumb reason I can't recall. This teacher also really liked my friend. So we decided how double standard she was. She had a strict policy of not putting your head down in her class, which is dang near impossible to do. She would just randomly tell us to read from our library books when she didn't feel like teaching. With this knowledge, me and my friend decided to put her to the test. Recall we are right next to each other. We both, in the exact same way, put our heads down on our arms. She walked around the opposite side of the classroom thinking we wouldn't see her. She finally showed up behind us. That's when she tapped on my desk, stood in awkward eye contact in silence, and said, keep your head up and read very sternly. After this, she walked away. Within a second or two, my friend and I died of laughter as she turned around and yelled at us for talking during reading time. This isn't the only time we've done this. Ugh. Teachers having, like, really obvious preferences for certain students does bug me. Like, everyone's human. You're going to obviously like certain people more than you like other people. You can't escape that part of nature. But when it's that obvious... It's just so frustrating. So, I don't know. I say if you're if you're still in that class, which I'm guessing probably not, but if you are, keep messing with her. Story 2. As a gay man, I find it really hard to be taken seriously in a professional environment. I make one joke and I'm the office clown, the gossip, the flaming queen. But my straight peers in the office get a quick laugh and back to work. I've noticed it everywhere I work. People apply this expectation that gay men are there for comic relief. This can be advantageous at times, but when you're actually trying to get a valid work point across, it can be infuriating. There's been times where I felt I could be listing Holocaust victims and people would be cackling telling me I'm too much because that's all they know slash have seen of how to interact with homosexuals, particularly homosexual men. I've, read up, I've reached a point where I stay as quiet as possible in working environments unless addressing work head on. I think this is because of Hollywood. The way Hollywood portrays gay men is horrible. They are always very flamboyant and are pretty much only given comedy roles. You almost never see gay characters that have serious roles in TV shows or movies. I think it has a serious effect on how people perceive gay people. I'll say, I think this has been getting better as time has gone on. We've seen a lot just, you know, better representation and not this one specified kind. But... It absolutely still is a thing. Um, it's carried over especially from the 90s and early 2000s where shows were trying to be like, hey, we support gay people, but also the butt of so many jokes and like sitcoms and stuff was basically, this person is gay. Ha 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 Like, that was the whole thing. And yeah, like the flamboyant stereotypes, 
I know flamboyant gay guys. They're wonderful. I know gay guys who are just absolutely stoic and serious and like woodworking and stuff. That People come in all shapes and sizes, and it sucks when you get pigeonholed like that. Story three, charities for kids get funding, clean water for kids, clothes for kids, food for kids, air pods for kids, but try to get funding for adults. Kids are seen as innocent, but adults just need to stop being lazy and get a job. Adults sometimes get stuck in impossible situations through no fault of their own. Having a job isn't a guarantee that nothing bad will ever happen to you. We'd have less kids in need if we helped the adults in their families and communities. The other one is drug addicts. Everyone says they should get clean, and they should, but people treat drug addicts in recovery just as bad or worse. No one wants treatment clinics in their neighborhood. It's hard to get a job already, and if you have to go to the clinic every day, people find out that you're in recovery, getting off drugs, and they don't want to talk to you. I work with people in recovery, and there's so many hoops to jump through just to get and keep treatment services. I think that anyone who wants to get clean deserves support and respect. It's a very tough road. Story 4. I always find it amusing that when I purchase chemicals for my company, I can order some real crazy crap, or stuff that can be used to do, make, or synthesize crazy crap without raising an eyebrow or having to submit documentation or business records because, hey, we've got an account so it must be legit. But when I order good old 99.9% .9 ethanol, which is really cheap for us because it's tax exempt, since we're using it for industrial purposes rather than drinking it for entertainment, there's a mountain of additional paperwork attesting to the above. At my workplace, we don't have to question some of the things people buy. We do try to anyway if they're sketchy folks, though. But on things like acetone, there's a long form that people need to fill out when they could just go to a dollar tree up the road and get the same strength stuff for roughly the same price at the same quantity without all the hassle. Story 5. A good friend and co-student and I are in very similar situations. We both started studying medicine after eight years of working in the same hospital. He's married, I live with my girlfriend, we both have to take the train about an hour, 45 minutes for me, one hour for him, to get to our university. We both had a lot of problems in our first year, especially with chemistry and biology. I recently asked to have one subject shoved into a later year so I have more time to study anatomy and other important subjects and refresh my knowledge of chemistry to then be ready for biochemistry, a subject most med students struggle with. I was able to change my entire curriculum the way I wanted, granted having to study one or two semesters longer because I have a three-year-old kid. They told him that his situation is not severe enough to grant him to study longer than usual, even though it could easily mean he won't be able to fulfill his dream. I mean, there is no doubt that having a child in your life is a big extra responsibility. I have no kids, and I know that my friends who do have kids, they've got so much more to deal with. Uh, there's no point in that kid's life where they're not dedicating a bunch of their time. And so I get that mindset, but I mean, just having that strictness when it comes to med school and like someone, like what this person is going through, it genuinely really isn't fair. And that just kind of sucks that it's all because this person doesn't have a kid from the way this looks. Story 6. Rabbits and any other pet. I had a black mini Rex, and she was the most intelligent rabbit I've ever had. She was litter trained, did tricks like standing up, kisses, and came when you called her name only as long as she felt like it. But whenever I talk about her to people like they talk about their dog or cat, people look at me like I'm mad. People always ask each other about how their dog or cat is, but start talking about a rabbit and they lose complete interest. When I told them how much I spent on the vets a few times, she's been ill, I've had some people say, why don't you just get a new one? Because it's a living thing. Another rabbit we got from a pet store turned out she had some problems, and the manager of the store said, why don't you return her and swap her for another one? Uh, how about frick off? She's a living creature that didn't ask to be here. Some people need to understand that there is a lot more to rabbits than meets the eye. Story 7 when I was a little kid, I left my toys out and one of my parents stepped on one and I got yelled at for leaving my toys all over the place. 
But if my parents left their tools out and I stepped on one, I got yelled at for not watching where I was stepping. The world is so complicated and confusing until you realize the people in it are imperfect. It really clicks when you realize a lot of them are really dumb as well. Story 8. When I went to Japan, I was heckled by my friends if I went and had American food. Yet when the same group of friends went out with Japanese guests here in the States, we always only went out to eat Japanese food. Story 9. I have lots of experience, like they are asking, but the employer thinks I'm too old for the job. This just makes me sad. Story 10. My parents say that our generation only does stuff so that we can take a picture and post it. And then whenever we go do something, my parents take a ton of pictures so that they can post them. It's funny. We've seen this kind of transition where, yeah, parents were always like, oh, get off your phones or get off the, you know, quit playing your little games and stuff and actually socialize. And I swear to God, more and more as I've gone to like family birthday parties and functions and stuff like that. I see the kids running around playing, having fun, and all the adults sitting there just like, oh, did you see this? Yeah. Yeah, right? Yeah. Total switch of things, and I hate it. Get off your phone, Mom. <laughs> oh, my mom's great. What are some subtle signs that a company is going downhill? Story 1. Payments being late ever, especially for employees and especially for taxes. If one of those things isn't getting paid on time, the company is probably close to insolvency. The people at Donut Time probably should have realized what was happening the moment their pay didn't go through the first time. Lack of advertising. Often, if a company is doing poorly, it's a good reason to start advertising. In this case, if they can't even afford that, it's another warning sign. Not hiring new or enough staff and not paying raises or bonuses and additionally treating staff a little worse. When money is tight, business owners care a bit less about their employees than usual. Key staff leaving is also a warning sign, especially if they left unexpectedly. Any cost-saving measures that go beyond what people would consider efficient or normal are also some warning signs. Not spending money to expand or to fix things that need fixing those run-down businesses with holes in the walls and dirty windows that have been there for months or more are often not doing too well. Perhaps if the, leaders, uh, if the leadership are public as well, if they are having public breakdowns or exhibiting erratic behavior, that can often be a telltale sign that something is wrong with their companies. Likewise, if your owners or leaders are usually in the office but have been out of office regularly and haven't given a clear indication why, that could be a sign that they are meeting with financiers, creditors, insolvency practitioners, or lawyers. Then, of course, if you have access to financial information, their liquidity ratios and their creditor relationships are big hints. Yeah, I feel like some of this is, uh, you know, fairly obvious, but there are those smaller telltale signs like you know they say you know having those public breakdowns or just not being around when your bosses are suddenly like gone more and more and they're not saying why or when higher up leadership just starts leaving positions especially if they leave positions for jobs that don't sound as good there's probably a reason for that story two a slow but steady reduction in fringe benefits with no appreciable explanation for the sudden need to penny pinch. I used to work for work support for a local startup. When I got hired, they would cater lunch every Friday. There was always a load of fruit baskets in the break room and free sodas slash waters in the fridge. Over the course of 18 months, it was reduced to one lunch a month, then none, then reductions on the frequency of restocking the beverages, then no restocking. Then the fruit bowl went from a mix of various fruits to just red apples, then none. Then the first round of layoffs, then the reduction of hours, then the second round of layoffs, then the restructuring. Then they filed Chapter 11 and terminated their entire support team. Now compare that to another place I worked that had very similar benefits. One day it was announced that we were going through an acquisition process, and as part of that, certain financial obligations had to be made so budgetary restrictions were put in place and the fringe benefits were reduced accordingly. Over the next six months or so, most of them returned some that weren't really being used as much, were rolled into other benefits where they would see more use.
I'll tell you right now, I love workplaces that do provide uh, really nice daily benefits for employees, like free food and beverages and stuff like that. A thing I will say that you should watch out for, though, are startups that do this and that do it like where it's like, wow, you guys are really giving a lot. Startups <laughs> aren't always run by people with, you know, the best minds for business. They might really want the the best for their employees. They might be trying to, you know, trying to offer their employees as much as possible and treat them great. But if they don't know how to run a business and they're offering all this extra stuff at cost to themselves without a proven record, that's that's a bad sign that a startup in the beginning might be going in the wrong direction. I, I think that companies should get to that place and should offer that stuff. But, you know, be reasonable at first and figure out what you can manage, you know, that. We could go on uh, like this a lot. Just be careful of startups. Story three. Temporary fixes become permanent features. If something breaks and still hasn't been fully repaired or replaced within two months, it's a sign that the economy is not healthy. If purchasing stops for consumables or quality suddenly deteriorates. Not the stuff that goes into the product itself, but basically anything to do with maintaining quality or safety. No rubber gloves appearing for two weeks, or the cheapest single-ply toilet paper in the restrooms. Suddenly, you're using a new and worse detergent, stuff like that. You know you're circling the drain when they start making cuts that directly affect the end product. Brand goods being replaced by generic attempts to shave a bit of expenses by swapping out the quality stuff with fillers. If you notice long-timers starting to disappear by now, it's a sign that you too should start sending out your resume. Next, you suddenly run out of stock. Stuff gets delayed. You suddenly find out that suppliers aren't showing up because bills have gone unpaid. By now, it's just a matter of time before your paycheck will bounce one day. Bankruptcy is months away at best because the only customers left are the long-timers who haven't found a better option. Story 4. There are many. Abrupt reduction in days or hours the business is open. Change in the quantity slash quality of goods being ordered. Change in yearly adjusted cost of living or raises. First item on the list, the company I was working for changed from a 7-day open for business schedule down to 5 days out of the blue. Satellite stores started getting closed soon after. Second item, company had overextended itself on its line of credit as it had overestimated demand. Now it is stuck with goods it can't sell and bills it can't pay. To cover this, they buy cheaper goods to try to generate revenue, but it's a sunk cost fallacy situation. Third, company is renowned for treating its workers well. All year, they tell you how they're landing larger accounts, and they are. Historically, after reviews were completed, a cost of living and a raise was given out to all employees like clockwork and without fail for over a decade. Not that year. All employees only got a cost of living adjustment. No raises. Turns out the company was sold. Layoffs occurred soon after. Story 5. One of the more subtle clues I've discovered is when a business starts posting new job offers at lower wages than before. I worked at a very large company that had quite a bit of turnover due to the seasonal nature of the job, would expand significantly in the summer, shrink around winter. So having rounds of hires and layoffs wasn't that unusual. I was fortunate enough to be in the minority of employees kept year-round, but one summer an eagle-eyed co-worker noticed that the job was being posted for much less hourly wage than the year previous. He bailed immediately. I wasn't planning on bailing myself, didn't think too much about it, and instead planned to stick around and see how it goes. But my co-worker put in a really good word for me at his new place, a place that was 30 minutes closer and paid more, so I eventually followed. He had the right idea. After that summer, the department closed completely, leaving dozens of my former co-workers in limbo. I was glad I got out early when the industry was in a summer hiring trend. Yeah, when you see businesses start to post, like, jobs within your department, your position, whatever you want to call it, and they're suddenly offering, like, less than you got brought on for, or, like, you know, you've been there for 10 years and they're offering it at, like the same rate that you were being offered, stuff like that, it kind of looks bad and it could either mean that something's bad might be coming down for the company 
or it could mean that they're going to try and replace you. And, you know, maybe not. Maybe that's not what's happening. But I've known enough people to where that's happened to them where it should be a bit of a red flag. Story six, when the best managers start quitting, especially the ones that have been there a long term. Also, when they get ridiculously stingy, like refusing to replace pens and paper clips. Story seven, my experience is that everything becomes about cost. Late from lunch, that's an extra cost. Spending longer than expected fixing something, that's an extra cost. It's an old job where I was eventually shown the door due to company financial failures. I was actually banned from going on customer site visits for a month because it was deemed by the boss that I was spending far too much time out of the office at customer sites and my mileage bill was too high. My job title? Field engineer. Story 8. Hospitality here when either or all of these happen. 1. Understaffed. Not just normal understaffing that you find in most places, but where there is literally one or two people covering way more than seems normal. 2. Start replacing ingredients in their drinks and meals. Try to squeeze more margin usually leads to lower quality product. 3. Lots of deals. When there's a 2 for 1 or 50% off on multiple days of the week. 1 and 2 are the biggest red flags. A lot of places in my experience have done both of these, and it's always a bad move. You go to a restaurant or bar for good products and good service. If a place starts to cut back on one or, God forbid, both of these, it will lead to a downward spiral in the business. Source, general manager of a bar slash restaurant. Oh, the replacing ingredients in, like, drinks and meals for, like, a restaurant or a bar, stuff like that, you see it happen so many times, and it's all... So many people want to start bars and restaurants. I want to. I have an idea. Oh, it'd be a tavern-style uh, restaurant. It'd have big booths for uh, people to play titter pigs, TTRPGs, stuff like that. Oh, it'd be amazing. Um, but I wouldn't because that kind of stuff is very, very hard. And a lot of these restaurants, there's so many things that go into that stuff. But... If you start reducing the quality of the food and stuff that you're serving, it's not going to help you make more money. You'll save money in the cost of your ingredients, and you will lose money because you are going to have less customers. It no, It's not going to pay off. You need to reduce how many things you're offering stuff. Yeah, Just watch an episode of, like, what is it, the Kitchen Nightmares or whatever with Gordon Ramsay. He's going to yell at people a whole lot. It's it's really grating at times, but, you know, he's right a lot. So, uh, I have <laughs> I have this unspoken desire to start beef with Gordon Ramsay, <laughs> even though I don't, I don't, the super angry bit, I don't like it that much. Like, I don't know. It just wears on me after a while. It's like, you donkey! It's, it's raw! Like, it just frustrates me. I think he's a talented chef. I think his shares in Hexclad and shilling for that stuff kind of sucks. But even though the part of the internet that I occupy and the part he occupies don't cross at all, I still just want to start beef with him and get him mad at me. <laughs> Which is, I admit, a weird aspiration to have, but... Come at me, Gordon. Please leave your story in the comments. I would love to make a video on them in the future. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe.